<clears throat> there we go. All right. So I thought I'd start out with this quote. It says, uh, in order to be successful, you must be willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. And I want to commend you, grade 12s, that you are doing something today that others are not doing. And I guarantee you that you will have the result and the success that you want tomorrow, whether it be in the year or within a year from now, that others won't have. OK, so with that in mind, let us get this session started. First things first, the format of the question paper. You need to understand, grade 12, that you are going to be the first group to write a new format, completely new format this year. OK, the examination will consist of two question papers. It's still two and a half hours. It's still 150 marks, but the format has changed. You will remember if you've worked through past papers, you always had section A, B and C. Uh, from this year up until we don't know when, there will only be section A, which will be short, uh, short answer questions such as uh, your multiple choice, terminology, your columns and statements. That's going to be 50 marks. And then <clears throat> section B, which, which will be a variety of questions, two uh, questions of 50 marks each. So if you have written a prelim examination, you would have seen this format. There is no longer a section C, which is your essay. So when you guys prepare for the um, <clears throat> exam and when you are working through past papers, even as soon as last year, you will see it still has an essay. Please don't study the essay. There is no longer an essay of 20 marks in your exams for this year up until further notice. Um, there might be a mini essay, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, there will no longer be an essay as it was in the past paper. So please remember when you are preparing, do not um, <clears throat> study the essay. OK, in fact, you can ignore the essay question completely. Don't even bother going through that. And please don't expect an essay end of the year. There is no essay. OK, I want to state that clearly. No essay for this year, only section A and B. Maybe it's easier for you, maybe not, but let's see what the question paper consists of. So paper one, which you will write first, um, let's just look at the, the, the content that will be covered here. You are going to write on um, uh, term one's work, which will start with reproduction invertebrates, human reproduction as well. You will see that uh, you, uh, reproduction invertebrates is 5%, which is about eight marks, so it's not a lot of marks. And then human reproduction, 27%, 41 marks, so quite heavy there. OK, from term two, you are going to write on responding to the environment. Humans, that's the nervous system, the eye, the brain, the ear, all of that nice stuff. That counts 36%, uh, 54 marks there. So that is the heaviest weighting. OK, and then from term three, which you guys probably already did last term, it's going to be plants responding to the environment. That's going to be 9%, about 13 marks. And then finally, the endocrine system, which will be 23 percent and 34 marks. And that gives you your 150 marks. What do you notice here? That meiosis is removed from paper one. Again, if you guys are going to prepare using past papers, which I know you would, you will see in paper one there is still meiosis. Let me reiterate and let me state this clearly. There is no meiosis in paper one this year. OK, so when you work through your past paper, and I hope you guys are taking notes of this. When you work through your past papers, let's say you're working from 2020, 2019, 18, 17, 16, 15, you will notice there's still my hostess in paper one. I want to state clearly that this year there will be no my hostess in paper one. OK, so please leave that for next paper or for tomorrow when I do paper two. All of my hostess from this year is in paper two. OK, so it's a very different format this year, guys. And um, you need to remember what to study for and what not to study for, basically, for each paper. Then paper two, which, which we'll do tomorrow, that's going to be DNA. That's about 18 percent, 27 marks. Meiosis, as I mentioned now, all of meiosis in paper two, that is 14 percent, 21 marks. And then obviously you will have from term one and two genetics and inheritance, 32 percent, about 48 marks. And then finally, the big one, the big daddy evolution. 36% and 54 marks. Everyone's favorite evolution. Not really, um, but it counts the most. But we'll do lots of that tomorrow, and I'm going to teach you how to approach that perfectly. OK, so that's your layout, guys, for paper one and paper two. This is obviously clearly stated in your exam guideline, which you should have in front of you. So 
two things to always have in front of you when studying for life sciences. One is your 2021 exam guideline. Let me just show you guys how that looks if you forgot. I'm just going to end the show quickly and I'm going to just open up this. Here we go. So it looks like this uh, 2021 examinations guideline. Um, this must be in front of you printed. If it's not printed or if you don't have a hard copy, please ask your teacher. Teacher, please give me this hard copy because this is your Bible when it comes to life sciences. I'm going to refer to this quite a bit, um, but there's the layout I just showed you guys now. There's paper one and there's paper two. Okay, so it states it in nicely for you. You'll also notice, and I'll mention this a bit later, that some of the content, meaning the things they've written down here for each topic, that has changed quite a bit. Um, but more on that a bit later. Okay, so always have this with you. 2021 exam guideline, as you're studying, you must have this in front of you. Why? Because this will guide you as to what to focus on and what to actually study. Okay, the second thing you must have is this little um, bug over here. I'm just opening my ebooks. It's called Mind the Gap. So if I open this quickly, um, this is the other tool you need to have in front of you. The Mind the Gap book. Okay, this one extremely, extremely important. Um, it's a very good and handy book. I'm also going to refer to this quite a bit um, to have with you as you're studying for your exam. Okay, so two things. Once again, Mind the Gap and then your 2021 exam guideline. All right. Um, and that is it for the um, first bit. I'm just going to open the learner's book, which you guys have in front of you. Let me just <clears throat> put that up. Let me just uh, minimize this. And uh, spoken. Of, I just spoke about that now. I just spoke about this here briefly. And I mentioned now topic uh, paper one and paper two for you, what we expect over there. And we are going to kick off with uh, section A. All right, so let's kick uh, the session off into um, session one, uh, which is uh, or section A, which is paper one, and looking at the multiple choice. So just as in the past, you would have section A starting with your multiple choice questions, and I know you guys have this in front of you. Um, what I would like to do for this section is I'll talk through each question, but as I talk through each question, I would like you guys to um, answer the question as we go uh, through it. And then I am going to go through the answers at the end of it. OK, just a few tips here for the multiple choice question. Please read the instructions very carefully. Um, you are expected to um, read. You obviously you are given reading time, so I expect, expected to read properly. So it says various possible answers are provided uh, to the questions. Choose the correct answer and O and write only the letter A to D next to the question number in your answer booklet, okay? And then they give you an example of 1.1.12 D. So when you get to the section, please do not make the mistake of writing out the whole phrase. You only write down the letter and the letter is quite, quite important to, to do, okay? So 1.1.1 in your answer book, you're gonna write that down and you're only gonna write the letter down. Make sure you only write one letter. If you are unsure, which is obviously normal, um, rather scratch out the incorrect answer and then you write the correct answer next to it, but don't, under any circumstances, write two letters, okay? Rather just stick to one. So let's jump into it. 1.1.1 has to do with um, hormones. So it says when a person is frightened, which response will occur? A, uh, um, adrenaline is released, heartbeat increases, pupils of the eyes dilate. B, um, adrenaline is released, once again, blood glucose increases, urine production increases, or C, Insulin is released, breathing rate increases, peristalsis stops, or D, insulin is released, eye pupils dilate, saliva secretion stops. Now, the first thing you need to understand here is what you are dealing with, okay? When a person is frightened, that should remind you of one thing, the fight or flight response, isn't it? And when the fight or flight response is activated, there is no insulin, so C and D is already out. Okay, so I'm teaching you now already one way to, to look at it is to cancel out what it can't be. So it can't be C or D. Why is that? Because we are dealing with the fight or flight or the stress response and the only hormone, not the only one, but the most important one is the uh, um, adrenaline hormone. So we are looking at A and B. All right. Now, what else must happen when you're... Um, 
when you are in, entering the fight or flight response, your heart beat is gonna, your heart beat, sorry, is gonna increase, obviously, and then we know that you um, you are gonna start wanting to either fight or flight. So you're looking at the hormone and looking at heartbeat. And the last thing that also happens during the fight or flight response is we know your pupils in the eye will dilate. Okay. So based on those facts, you can now see, okay, A, adrenaline is released, heartbeat increase, that's true. Pupils of the eyes dilate, that's true. So that is a possible option. Don't just choose A, just make it a point of, okay, it could be A, then B, uh, again, uh, um, adrenaline is released, blood glucose increases, so we, that's totally true. Urine production increases, also maybe not. So the one you are most sure of, that in more often than not will be the correct answer. And I'm gonna give you guys the option to choose A or B. We're gonna look at the answers a bit later. Okay, so that's how you approach it. You cancel out what it can't be. 1.1.2 says which of the following involves the development of the young inside the uterus of the mother where it receives nutrients through the placenta. Now, this one is quite important. Here you have A, ovipari, B, vivipari, C, ovivipari, or D, amniotic egg. Now, this is quite key. Here you need to guys, you guys need to understand the difference between ovipari, vivipari, and ovivipari. Okay, now this is a very, very confusing topic for all the learners. So if you struggle with this in particular, okay, I want to redirect you to Mind the Gap. If you guys go to page uh, 17 of Mind the Gap, you can make a note of it. For yourself, you'll see there's a nice little table here that speaks to ovipari, vivipari, and ovipari. Okay, and we can clearly see that ovipari is when the eggs are laid and the hatching takes place outside of the mother. So that's your chickens, your birds. Vivipari is when the young develops inside the uterus of the mother after the eggs are fertilized internally. So you should think about humans in this case. Okay, so humans are vivipari because they we um, develop inside. And ovivipari has to do with the young that develops from eggs that are fertilized internally and retained within the mother's body after fertilization until they hatch. So this should remind you of sharks, for example, that keep their eggs inside of their body. So what I like to do is I like to attach an animal next to each one of these definitions. So for me personally, ovipari, I think chicken, bird. Okay, vivipari, I think human. Okay, because the baby is inside the mother, there's a placenta, that's where the, the, the um, baby gets um, nutrients. And ovipari, I think shark, because sharks usually keep their eggs inside their body and in their head. So for this question or for this type of work to remember this, just attach an animal to each phrase. So ovipari, remember now, what would you attach ovipari to? I um, I say that would be, for example, a human, vivipari. Um, I said vivipari would have to, you You must now choose for yourself which type of animal you could, you could attach that to. Um, sorry, vivipari is the human, ovipari is the, is the chicken, and then ovipari would be a shark. Now the question says that it, the baby gets nutrients to the placenta. Okay, and we know the placenta has to do with human babies. Okay, now you must ask yourself, okay, which one of these definitions did Sir say I must attach a human to? And that was vivipari. Okay, and as you can see there, the answer would be B, which would be vivipari. I hope that makes a bit of sense um, to you guys. If not, I will happily repeat it, but this is nicely laid out for you in Mind the Gap on page 17. Right, let's move on. If you have any questions, please, please do stop me. Okay, 1 to 1.3. Now, here is a typical example where they give you a whole bunch of terms, and I know this one it gets confusing for learners as well, whereby you are given a list of terms and then you must choose. Um, which one matches, okay? And you must choose between the nominators, one, two, and three. And usually the learners lose their minds here. I want you guys, when you see this question, I want you to slow down. I want you to read the question, and I want you to read the question twice before you answer, okay? So let's go through it quickly. It gives you a list of um, terms below relating to reproduction. Again, now you need to understand what each one of these means. Precocial development, altricial development, amniotic egg, Parental K. All right, so it gives you those list of terms there. Now, once again, if you're a student in grade uh, 12, 
and you are unsure of what each of these mean, I will refer you again to Mind the Gap. I love this book, okay? And you will see there's pre social there's alteration development, and there's parental care for you over there. So let's go through it quickly just to revise. pre social is when the hatchlings are well developed when they hatch, the eyes are open, they are able to move, and they can feed. Again, attach an animal to this. Think about your wildebeest, think about your zebras, think about um, babies or hatchlings that are born and they are already well developed. They can already run, not run, but stand up and walk, and their eyes are already open at birth. Um, all three should development, the hatchlings are poorly developed when they hatch, they are unable to feed on their own, and they cannot move. Okay, so what would that be? That would probably be again like birds, for example, where the hatchlings can't feed themselves and their eyes are closed. That's an animal that you attach to the name. Okay, and then we know parental care has to do with the building of nests, protection, etc. So now looking at the question, it now gave you that. So I know now pre kosher development, I know what that means, I know what altricial means, and I know the amniotic egg, and I know parental care. Now it says which one of the terms above refer to um, strategies used by birds that incubate the eggs in the nest and feed the young. Now remember what I said, if you attach an animal to each of these names, then it's gonna make sense to you, okay? And if you remember which one did I refer to as the birds um, being incubated by the eggs, maybe you forgot that was precocial develop, uh, uh, altricial development where the hatchlings are weak and their eyes are closed. So altricial had to do with the birds, so number two, would be one of them and I'm just going to highlight that okay so if you're a student what you would put next to you for yourself is maybe a tick or just an asterisk just to say okay all three shell hatchlings are not well developed their eyes are closed birds also have amniotic egg so I'm going to highlight that we know that okay and then finally parental care do some birds care for the young yes they absolutely do and I can highlight parental care now you guys want to highlight this so all you can do is you can make an asterisk or you can make a tick just to make sure for yourself that you've mentioned what's in there. Okay, now this precocial development fit. No, it does not. Why not? Because precocial is when the hatchlings are well developed. Okay, and they hatch with their eyes open already. So two, three, and four fits. Number one doesn't fit. Let's see which one of these options have two, three, and four inside of them. So A has one. Can't be A because we know precocial development doesn't fit. So A is out. Okay, I hope you guys notice what I'm doing. I don't even read the rest. I know A is out because one doesn't fit. B has one that doesn't fit because as I, as I said, precocial development is out completely. Uh, C could be C because two, three, and four only. I did highlight two, three, and four, but maybe it's D also. So before we choose the answer, let us look at D. D will say one, oh, it can't be D because there's one D, we know one doesn't fit. So the only acceptable answer there was C. Okay, I hope that made a little bit of sense for you guys. This is just how I think, shouldn't, it doesn't have to be how you think, but it just makes it easier for me. Okay, so when it comes to um, reproduction in, in vertebrates, attach animals to these different terms to help you remember what each one has to deal with. Okay, I'm going to go a bit quicker through the rest so that we just make up some time. So here you have a diagram that shows the fetus, and this is obviously a human baby. Um, and when, when it comes to diagrams, grade uh, 12s, before you even look at the answer, I want you guys to label. So let's label number one. What would number one be? That will be the placenta. Uh, number two, I want someone to give me number two. I'm not going to name number two. I want a school or a learner to tell me what is number two. And number three, that would be the amniotic fluid or the amnion which the baby is in. Okay. Now you know what number one, number two, and number three is. I asked you guys to name for me number two. I'll check that now. Now it is during gestation. Which parts were labeled one, two, three removes metabolic waste? Now I'm going to pause here for about a minute or minute and a half and ask you guys to answer this one for me. So a bit of a tricky one. Which one do you think it is? Okay, between numbers one, two, and three. So A only, B only, C or D. It's gonna give about 30 seconds for that.
So all the schools are encouraged to type your answer in the chat or send it via WhatsApp. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melissa. If there is an answer, you can just read it out to me. Another 10 seconds, then I'm going to continue. All right, let's see. Is there any school, any learner that has an answer for me? We have an hey. answer from Perseverance and from Panache. I'm okay. listening. B. <laughs> I heard B. Yeah, anyone else say anything else besides B? They're both saying B. It's from WhatsApp. Okay, fantastic. B. Okay, let's look at that quickly. Um, well, A, what did we say A was? A was the placenta. Um, does the placenta remove metabolic waste? Correct, it does. So number one, it could be number one, okay, because the placenta removes metabolic waste. Uh, B says one and two. Um, number two was the umbilical cord. I did ask what that was, so that's the umbilical cord. Um, what does the umbilical cord do? The umbilical cord provides blood, oxygen, as well as takes away CO2 from the baby. Um, and then number three we know is the amniotic fluid and that protects the baby from shock. So we know it can't be number three. Now watch what I do again. Anything with number three you eliminate. So number C will be incorrect because number three is in there. Remember I said it can't be number three because that protects the baby from shock. Um, D, one, two, and three, D is also eliminated. So only A and B remain. And the correct answer is B. So well done to those two learners. It is one and two. And just to tell you the reason why it is not just one, the placenta, is because the umbilical cord also removes um, waste. What waste exactly is carbon dioxide. Okay, so carbon dioxide is removed by the umbilical artery, and that's why it's one and two. So well done on that. Thank you for that, learners. Um, let's go quickly to 1.1.5 and from year on I'm going to ask you guys to fill in the answers and then just check the answers in a few minutes. So here we have um, a bee sting. So the bee sting is the person on his finger and then um, it says that the diagram below shows the part of a person's nervous system that has been cut at X. So it's cut right here by X. I'm going to just zoom in quite a bit. There we go. All right, so you cut that over there. Now it says when the bee stings the person's finger, what is going to happen um, or what are the effects of the sting on the person? Okay, you have A, B, C, and D. I'm going to give you guys just 10 seconds to choose A, B, C, or D, and then I'm going to move on. Make that five seconds. Mm -hmm. So we have an answer C from Perseverance Secondary School. So C, the person feels pain and does not move his or arm. Right. So which part of X or rather what part is um, X in terms of the reflex arc? Ask yourself that. Is it a sensory neuron? Is it the motor neuron? Is it the interneuron? We can clearly see it's the sensory neuron. Okay. So now, sorry, we've got the whole alphabet here. We've got C, D, oh. and A. <laughs> okay, let me just note down all the answers. So the first one you said was C, am I correct? C, D, and A. C, D, A. Okay, let me let me work through those options quickly and see which one is correct. Um, let us focus on the image first. So if you cut uh, the person or if you cut the, the sensory neuron at X, what's going to happen when the bee stings the finger? The most common answer here, and I know the first person that jumped onto this, okay, we know that if you cut the motor neuron, for example, the person will feel the pain, but they won't move because the motor neuron is cut, obviously, okay. But now you are cutting by X. So the question is, if you cut by X, will the person move? The answer is no, because you've made a cut by X, so the person won't move. So anything where it says the person can move, that is obviously incorrect, okay because the person won't be able to move um, because you've cut this over here. Okay, remember that. Um, and the second thing is when you cut the sensory neuron, now notice that if the cut is made right before the spinal cord or right before the central nervous system. Because you're cutting it before the central nervous system, 
meaning before it gets into the central nervous system over there, the person won't feel the pain. They won't feel the pain. Why don't they feel the pain? Because the impulse does not reach the, cent uh, the central nervous system. So the person won't move and the person won't feel the pain. Okay, so remember those two things. The person won't move and the person won't feel the pain. So let's see which one matches. A, the person feels no pain. That's correct, as I said. And the person does not move. That's correct. But let's not stop there. Let's go on. B, the person feels no pain. True. And the person moves. That's not true. Okay, because remember I said you've cut the, the point there. So the person doesn't move. Um, C, the person feels pain and does not move. That's incorrect because remember I said the impulse does not reach the nervous system, the central nervous system, so they feel no pain. So it can't be C. And then D, the person feels pain. Don't even have to, you don't even have to read further. That's not true because we know the person feels no pain. So the most correct answer here would be A. The person feels no pain and he does not move his arm away. Okay. So well done on the person that said A. C and D is incorrect. As I said, the impulse doesn't reach the central nervous system, so there's no pain. And then D, um, the person doesn't move his arm away. All right. I hope that made a bit of sense to you guys with the last two questions here quickly. Um, here you have a diagram showing a germinating seed. Um, uh, here you just have to uh, notice that um, it says which of the diagrams uh, shows the appearance of the radical after three days. So before we answer this question, I just want to mention that when you have a rotating um, a rotating thing or a rotating appa apparatus, okay, please remember this, that when it's rotating and it says it's rotating slowly, then geotropism does not occur downwards. There won't be downward growth when something is rotating. So I'm just going to mention that to you guys there. Remember that it can't grow downwards because it is obviously rotating. Okay, so now you have to just look at these images and um, say how the, the radical will grow here, A, B, C, or D. You guys choose an answer. I'm going to have to move on for the sake of time. And then 1.7 um, says the diagram below shows a neuron. First thing you do here, identify the type of neuron. Okay, before you look at the question, is this a motor neuron? Is this an interneuron? Is this a um, sensory neuron? Decide that for yourself. And we know that the, the impulse will always go from the dendrites all the way to the nerve endings. And we know your dendrites are over here and your nerve endings are over there. So now you can answer that question. So identify the neuron. If you say it's a sensory neuron, then you know what it will be. If you say it's a motor neuron, and that's the one, then you must just identify the direction of the impulse. So you guys can choose A, B, C, or D. I'm gonna come back to this, show you the answers in a few minutes. Please choose this for me. Um, I think you guys do have this in front of you, so I can move on, but you can just choose an answer there. I will show you the answers now. And then 1.1.8 says, which one of the following plant hormones is responsible for the germinating of the seeds? This one is quite easy. You choose an answer. I'll show you guys the answers in a minute. And then the last two questions says, as a result of sympathetic uh, section of the autonomic nervous system, what's going to happen? Now, I just want to pause here for a second. What does the sympathetic nervous system have to do with in the human body? The, the one thing that must come to mind is fight or flight. So when you guys see this word, sympathetic nervous system, or sympathetic section, please think fight or flight. That, that, that must be in your mind, okay, fight or flight. And then what's going to um, have an effect on the fight or flight? Pupils dilate, yep. Peristalsis increase, not really. Heart rate decrease. Ask yourself if you want to fight or flight, will your heart rate increase or will your heart rate decrease? Okay? And then blood vessels in the skin dilate. So that has to do with the fight or flight response. Choose an answer A, B, C, or D. You choose. I'm going to move on. Show you guys the answers in a second. And then it says question 1.10 and 1.11 are based on a diagram. And here I'm going to stand still for just an, um, two minutes or so. So here's your reflex arc. And I know you guys know your work on the reflex arc. This is a very, very common question. You have to give the correct letter 
and the correct label. Okay, now before you answer a question, remember what I said, label it. Okay, so let's start here by A. So if you look at A here, A is inside the central nervous system. And now you ask yourself, which is A? A would be a interneuron. Okay, B, B is over there. That would be part of your sensory neuron that will now connect to the interneuron over here. So A is your interneuron, B is your sensory neuron. And then if you look at um, C, um, C is also part of your sensory neuron over there. D is your receptor and E is your motor neuron. Okay, A could also be your spinal cord and then B and C could also, actually C could be your, your um, sensory neuron and B could also be your, your interneuron. Okay, so now that you know your, your labels, it just says give the correct label and letter. A sensory neuron. Now, if you look at A over here, we know A cannot be a sensory neuron, okay, because the sensory neuron must be close to the receptor. So that can't be A. B is the motor neuron. Remember, that can't be true because where was the motor neuron? The motor neuron was by E. It goes to the muscle, okay. And C is the sensory neuron. Um, that would be correct because here you can see there's the receptor and that follows the sensory neuron up until there. And then um, D is the central nervous system. Now, that's obviously not true because D is the receptor. Okay, so you can answer 1.1.10 for me. We'll look at the answers now in a second. And then finally, 1.11 says um, the correct letter and label of the neuron transmitting the impulse ray effector. Now, what takes the impulse ray effector? That would be the motor neuron. Remember, the effector is your muscle. So the only thing that's the motor neuron is E. Okay, and then you can answer 1.1.11. Okay, I'm just going to pause there and um, go to the answers for you guys just to summarize that section. And you guys can just uh, see what you got right, what you got wrong, and then we're going to move on. So here is the answers for that. So we did number 1.1.2 up until 1.5 I did with you guys. Just going to zoom in a bit more until 1.10 and 1.1.11, so from there. Okay, as you guys can see, it's about two marks each. If you have any questions, you guys can just let me know. Okay, moving on to 1.2, give the correct biological term, right? This one is all you, all you guys. It's now exactly uh, 10 to, I'm gonna give you guys until about, um, it's 10.50. I'm gonna give you until about 10.53 or maybe 10.54 to write down the correct biological terms from 1.2.1 until 1.2.9. It's all you, you go. I will give you guys, yeah, let's make it three minutes just for the sake of time. So I'll give you three minutes just to read through it, see if you can get the correct biological term, and then we will look at the answers at 10.53. You guys go. Right, um, so here, yeah, let's just speak about this quickly. We know that when you give the correct biological term, okay, spelling is important, but we know that we don't always spell the words correctly. So if you see a phrase and you know the answer, but you don't know the spelling, I want you guys to try and spell it as close to the answer or to the correct answer as possible. In fact, you can write the word out and if it sounds like the correct answer then we will probably give you the mark but only if you spell it as close to the answer as possible so let's look at the memo and you can see how many you got correct there we go for 1.2 just give yourself a mark 1.2.1 multiple scler sclerosis once again if you spelled it incorrectly let's say you use the k Instead of a C, you'd still get the mark. If you used a, a, a E or a Y instead of an I, you would also get the mark for that. Okay, 1.2.2 is prolactin. 1.2.3 is the hypothalamus. It's not the pituitary gland. Okay, remember it's the hypothalamus. Um, so if you wrote the gland that secretes the hormone which controls water concentration, if you wrote the pituitary gland, that's incorrect because which hormone are we dealing with here? That's the hormone called aldosterone in ADH, okay? And that's by the hypothalamus. 1.2.4, altricial, 1.2.5, external fertilization. You might have written ovipary there, or maybe you wrote, you wrote ovipary, but it's external fertilization. 
1.2.6 is ovipary and 1.2.7 aldosterone 1.2.8 reflex action and 1.2.9 amniotic egg or amniotic egg okay any questions for this one i want to leave it up for another second another five seconds or so for you guys to mark Right, uh, your silence, I'm assuming everyone is okay. So um, with your permission, I'm gonna go on to 1.3. Okay, so uh, sorry, sorry, sorry guys. I forgot these last two over here. My apologies, just 1.2.8 1.2.9 if you didn't see it. Um, I'm sure you guys wrote it down now in the memo. Um, just on 1.3 quickly, um, here it has to do with column one and column two. Uh, before we go into it, just one thing to remember here is that you only write the letter. Either you write A only, which is stated here, B only, both A or B, or none. That's extremely, extremely important. Okay, so this is this is again all you guys. I'm going to give you, uh, it's now 10.56. I'm going to give you until 11 o'clock exactly to answer this one over here. So you either write A only, B only, both um, a and B or none next to the question number and let's see uh, which school can get this one the fastest I'm gonna just minimize this um, the fastest answers to come through we can have a little competition going for this one okay so let's go starting now A only B only A and B or none right so remember now you guys you have to write A only B only um, both or none and um, they will not always, but most of the time there will be something that has none in it. So in this case, there should be, but let's see with the memo what the answers were. So let's see who got this the most correct. It's A, B, B, and none. Okay, so 1.3.1 was A only, two marks over there. Give yourself a mark. 1.3.2 uh, was B only, 1.3.3 B only, and 1.3.4 was none. Okay. I'm going to speak about 1.3.4 quickly, just be because of, um, as I said, there will be a none for this. So 1.3.1 uh, was quite easy. I think 3.2 was also um, easy. It is used the stimulus and converts it to an impulse. And then 1.3.4 was a tough one because it says the receptor in the ear responsible for balance. Now, when you see the word balance, uh, grade 12, two things must come to mind, especially with the receptor, the crista or the cristia. That's the first one, the crystal and then the macula. Okay, that plays a role in balance in the ear. The organ of corti, who wants to tell me where that plays a role in? Just an, a, sec, an, a few seconds to give you guys a chance. Organs of corti, where does that play a role or what does that have to do with? Anybody want to tell me? Does it have to do with the eyes? Does it have to do with the ear? Does it have to do with sight or does it have to do with balance or to do with hearing? What does the organs of corti have to deal with? Hearing, fantastic perseverance leading the pack again. So the organs of corti is stimulated when you are busy with hearing. So as soon as you see organs of corti, can't be balanced. Why not? Because that has to do with sound or hearing. Okay. And the cones we know has to do with sight. So 1.3.4 was none. Okay. So well done to you guys for getting it right. You guys have been fantastic. Well done. I'm loving the interaction. Please keep it up. Okay, that is uh, the end of that 1.1 to 1.3. Let's go on to 1.4. Okay, now over here, we I'm going to try and make this also a bit interactive, but I'm going to move a little, not faster, but I'm going to just pick up the pace just for the sake of time, but I will slow down if you guys feel I'm going too fast. Here it says study the diagram below, <clears throat> excuse me, showing the endocrine glands in the human. Now, I'm going to repeat this grade 12s. Whenever you see a diagram, I don't care what the question is. You don't care what the question is. You just label. You just go nuts and you label whatever you see. So let's label this quickly, okay? A would be the pituitary gland. Write it in there. That's A. B would be your thyroid gland. So you can write B. Uh, what would D be? Someone tell me what D is. 
Uh, C would be the pancreas. Okay, so I'm going to repeat what I said. A is the pituitary gland. You must give me D. B is the thyroid gland. And C would be the pancreas. What would be D? Let's see who was fast on the chat. Adrenal gland. Fantastic PSH. That would be your adrenal gland. So now you've labeled it. Okay, so step one, grade 12. You don't care about the question. Okay, the question will be there. You just label. So you've labeled now. Let's go to the question. Identify the letter of the endocrine gland. That's a crit glucagon. That's an easy one. That's C. And you already write the letter in. Now, if you go and you write in your pancreas, and I'm just going to write it in. Okay, <clears throat> that's going to be incorrect. All right. And why is it incorrect? <clears throat> Even though the answer is correct. You are not following the instruction that says write the letter. The letter is only the letter. They don't want the whole word. Don't try. <clears throat> I always tell my kids, don't try and be smart and write in the word to show that you know. Follow your instructions, the letter. So the letter for number one would be C. Okay. Um, for number two, controls the metabolic processes. Now this one could be tough. Okay. I want you guys to tell me fastest person on the chat. It, it's between B and between A and between D, or could be C also, A, B, D. You guys let me know. <clears throat> and then number three, secrete uh, um, adrenaline. That's an easy one. That's the adrenal glands over there. I see the chat popping up already. Perseverance is it's C, which is the pancreas. So let's just look at 1.4 quickly. Okay, I got another answer here. I got B, I got D. Yeah, that's what I said. This one <laughs> could be any one of those. Okay, but let's try and narrow it down. How are we going to narrow it down for ourselves? Well, you have to ask yourself which one of these glands, A, B, C, or D, is going to have a direct impact on your metabolic process, meaning it's going to control the meta uh, metabolic process over there. Um, from the answer, it was C. I gave you that one. Number two is B. Okay, we, what was B? B was the thyroid gland, and number um, three was D. Okay, I see something in the chat quickly. There we go, B is H, C, C, probably D, C, B, D could be either one. Now, that's what I said to you guys. It's confusing because it could be any, but here is what you do. You have to ask yourself, okay, which one of these would have the, I want to say the most or the highest impact. The, the correct word I'm looking for is a direct impact. It can be, it must be B because B will obviously secrete the hormone thy, um, thyroxine and thyroxine speeds up your metabolic process. Yes, it can be C because C will um, secrete insulin, which will break down or store glucose and all of that. Um, yes, it can be D because D can secrete uh, um, adrenaline, which will help speed up your metabolic process. But the one that has a direct impact, the most impact, if I can put it that way, is B. Why B? Because B secretes thyroxine and thyroxine increases your metabolic rate. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, you are not wrong if you said C and D. Okay. But B is the most correct answer. B is the most correct answer for that one. All right. Um, let's go on to 154.2. Name two hormones secreted by A. Um, what is A? A is the pituitary gland. And here you can have any of the following two Growth hormone, TSH, FSH, or LH. And that is for you listed over there. Okay, growth, TSH, FSH, even LH, and also prolactin. Where do these hormones come from? They come from the pituitary gland. Okay, and I hope that makes a bit of sense for you guys over there. All right, and then um, that's 1.4. We're making nice progress. Now let's go to 1.5. This one is a bit of a tricky one. This is a bit of a tricky one. So I want you guys to work with me here. Try and work with me here. They're giving you a flow chart, and it says the flow chart below shows the control of thyroxine levels in the human body. Now remember, I said, what does thyroxine do? It's going to increase your metabolic rate, isn't it? So let's, let us work um, with this one together. You have this flow diagram. Again, ignore the questions. Just fill in the missing information. So here's what I want you guys to do for me. By number one, fill in what's going to happen here. You have the normal thyroxine levels. Something happens, decrease, increase, stay the same. That has a knock-on effect on number two, which is a gland, which will re release something in number three, which is a hormone. 
and then has a knock-on effect on number four, which is another gland, which will release five, the hormone more or less the same, and it increases the that, um, thyroxin level. So let me give you guys just a quick uh, minute or two to just fill this in for me. So just fill in what happens at number one, what's happening at number two, and what's happening at number three, four, and five before you look at the questions. All you, you guys do that. We we'll look at it in a few, in a minute or two. See my chat is blowing up. Okay, see that. Thank you, Mr. Fergus. Can I give another <clears throat> thirty seconds, thirty twenty five seconds? Okay, I have one decrease. Okay, I see people are communicating now to pituitary gland. Who wants to give three, four, five? You can write increase, decrease stays the same, uh, more or less. That's the words I'm looking for here and the names of the glands. Another five seconds or let me make it 10, just for you guys to finish up and then I'll look at the questions. So you're just labeling, right? You're just filling in the missing information. Here we go. Let's look at the questions quickly. So now you've, you've filled in what you think happens. And now we are going to look at the question. So here it says, which mechanism is represented in the flow chart above? That's obviously the one that you've been taught over and over and over and over and over again. It's a negative feedback. Okay, so that will be negative feedback. And then 1.5.2 says, summarize the changes in thyroxine levels shown in the flow chart above by writing the number and the word in your answer book. Now, if you did what I asked you to do, you just fold in the the numbers and the words without looking at the question, 1.5.2 will be very easy for you. Um, and let's look at that quickly. So yeah, I see a few more words, this, H, okay. So I see perseverance coming through strongly there. So let's see here. So here you'll see the roxin levels are gonna do something and then they're gonna increase again at the at the other end over there, okay? Uh, thyroid, okay, I see perseverance is killing it on the chat with the answers. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show the memo now. So thyroxine levels, if we look at a negative feedback and if it's going back to increasing, we know at number one, it's going to decrease. So that will be decrease over there. So as soon as the thy um, thyroxine levels decrease, that is going to send a message to some other gland. Okay, now you would know already from the question above, and this is what, something you guys should remember. Always go back to the previous questions that there's a gland here at A, okay? That is called the pituitary gland. And we know there's another gland also called the thyroid gland, but we are looking at the pituitary gland because when thyroxine decreases, a message is sent to the pituitary gland to release more. What is number three going to be? It's not thyroxine. It's not thyroxine. Why is it not thyroxine? And why am I saying that? Here's what I want you guys to remember. Thyroxine comes from the thyroid gland. This gland over here, I can't now highlight it, but where my mouse pointer is, that's where thyroxine comes from. TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone, comes from the pituitary gland, which is A over there. And when there is more of that, that's gonna work on this gland to produce or rather to um, inhibit thyroxine levels, okay? Because it's a negative feedback mechanism. So that would be number two and number three over there. 
and number four would be the TSH, and number five would be more thyroxin. And I'm going to show you guys the memo, and it is over there. Okay, you can just give yourself a mark for whatever you got correct. And if there's any questions, you guys are welcome to just ask me to go over it again or to just repeat anything. Right, if um, everyone is done, I'm going to continue. Uh, if you are still busy, please just shout and tell me, sir, just pause, wait, stop, and then I will uh, pause for a bit longer. But I'm going to continue just for the sake of time. Okay, so we've now covered um, 1.5, and that is the end of section A, 50 marks. Okay, so that's section A, and I know I spend a lot of time there. We, we're definitely not going to finish this whole paper in the session, but I'll finish it up tomorrow. Um, but if you guys have any questions for section A, I will be happy to go back to anything. Okay, let's go to section B. All right, now remember section B is going to be your, your longer questions. And section B is going to have two questions um, of question two and question three only in the exam. Okay, and we are looking at question two first. And question two has to do with a diagram once again. And it says a diagram below shows a side view of the male reproductive system. And what is the first thing you do when you see a diagram grade 12s? You label, you label, you label, you label. You forget the question and you just label. So let's label A is the testis, B is the epididymis, uh, C is the scrotum, and the, uh, the vast difference is already labeled for you. So now you've labeled testis, epididymis, and the scrotum, okay. 2.1.1, uh, again, I ask you to label it and see now, because you've labeled it already, you can now label number A, B, and C. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. And then it says, 2.1 says, um, describe the process of um, um, spermatogenesis as it occurs in part A. I sort of highlighted this as well. Now, this is something that you just have to study, guys. You just have to study this. And I'm going to just go to your exam guideline, which is here. And if you look, go to your exam guideline, it gives you a nice outline of these processes. So let me just find spermatogenesis quickly. Mm, I think I went past it. Here we go. OK, so if you go to your exam guideline on um, page 12, OK, which has to do with human reproduction, you will find here is both spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Let me just zoom in for you guys. There we go. And here it summarizes the process, process of spermatogenesis, which you can study as is. You can literally just study these three bullets. Here we go. Just wanted to highlight that. And if you study these three bullets, that's how you give it back to the, to the um, teacher or to the examiner in of the year. What's going to happen under the influence of testosterone, diploid cells in the um, semi nephritis tubules will undergo meiosis to form haploid sperm cells. Just those three bullets. I suggest you guys study that as it is. In fact, while you're here, you study the process of oogenesis as well, because they're going to ask you one of these two, guaranteed. Either this one or this one, or they're going to ask both. OK, so let's go to the question again. You must describe the process of um, sp 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 spermatogenesis as it occurs in part A. And as I showed you guys now, it is exactly as it is given in the exam guideline. OK, meaning under the influence of testosterone, diploid cells um, will undergo meiosis to form haploid sperm cells. And we saw these words are exactly as it is right over here. OK, and I hope that makes sense to you guys. Let me actually make that in blue. OK, so study this from the exam guideline. It's three bullets. That should be very easy for you guys. Um, and you give it back exactly as that in the test. OK. 2.1.3 is um, what I wanted you guys to do uh, because this is a bit of a higher order question where you must think a bit further. It says the test results show that a man has a low sperm count. Explain why a doctor would advise the man to wear underwear that is not tight. Okay, so this one I want you guys to do for me. I'm going to continue, but I want you guys to just figure that one out and send me an answer in the chat. Um, that's a bit of a higher order question, that one over there. Okay, so I'm coming back to that one in a second. 
2.4 says during a vasectomy, the vast difference of both from both the testes is cut. Explain one reason why a man does not want to have children will choose to have a vasectomy. So here, obviously, if you um, looking at your 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 um, diagram, if you cut the vast difference, okay, one mistake learners often make that I've seen now when marking in a video is that the learners say there is no sperm. The male makes no sperm. That's not correct. Okay. If you have a vasectomy, or if a man has a vasectomy, there is still sperm. So that has to be very, very clear because the testis is still intact. Um, it, the man can still make sperm. So if you write there is no sperm, that is incorrect. But there is no sperm that's going to be ejaculated. That's important to remember. So when you cut the vast difference, the sperm does not have a pathway to be ejaculated. So no sperm on its own is correct. Okay. Uh, sorry, no sperm on its own is incorrect, but no sperm being ejaculated will be the correct answer. Okay, so if a man does not want to have children or lose, uh, will have a vasectomy, it's because during ejaculation, no sperm will be ejaculated or no sperm will leave the testis or leave the penis. Okay, um, number B says has had a vasectomy and is still capable of ejaculation. Now, this one is also important. So learners write, the person had a vasectomy, they cannot ejaculate. That's not true. The person can still ejaculate because there is still the fluid part of the semen, which comes from the corpus gland and the other accessory gland. So just keep those two things in mind when we look at the memo in a second. Okay, I'm going to start with 2.4 and then look at 2.1.3. I see there's something in the chat. Will do, will do, sir. Will do, thank you. I must slow down a bit. So let's just go over 2.1.3 again. It says the test results show that a man has a low sperm count. Why would a doctor advise the man to wear um, underwear that is not tight? Okay, that's the one I want you guys to do for me. Remember, um, we'll look at it now. Um, this one about a vasectomy. So let's focus on that again. Remember when a man has a vasectomy, um, he will not... Um, release sperm, there is still sperm. So just I want you guys to remember that there is still sperm. Don't say the man has no sperm because he had a vasectomy. That's not true, there is sperm. But the sperm cannot leave the, the um, testis basically because the vast difference, which is where the sperm comes from, is cut. Okay. Or you could say the sperm that comes from the epidermis does not leave the testis or does not become ejaculated. So that's the two things I want to focus on for the vasectomy. And B, why is the man still capable of ejaculation? That's because the fluid part of semen is still there. Even though there's no sperm, the fluid part. Now, where does the fluid part come from? It comes from the corpus gland, the, pro, the, the prostate gland, and all the, the other X um, accessory glands. So those is what I want you to keep in mind. The fluid part is still there. 2.3 was the one I want you guys to answer for me. I saw there was an answer here that says damaged nerves can't produce enough healthy sperm, disrupts blood flow. Okay, PSH is on the right track. It has to do with unhealthy sperm. What happens if a man wears tight-fitting underwear? We know that the, if he has tight-fitting underwear, then the scrotum or the testis will be close to the body and the body is at 37 degrees and that is not good for sperm production. We know that the, the testis must always be two to three degrees less than, than, than the body temperature for optimal sperm production. So if a man has a low sperm count, you want to keep the testis cool. That's the bottom line. You don't want to keep the testis warm or keep it hot because when it's too hot or when it's close to the body, it's going to be too warm or too hot. And because it's too warm or too hot, that's going to have a negative impact on sperm production. So if you are thinking or writing along the lines of unhealthy sperm, you're on the right track. Um, too hot, you're on the right track. Um, it mustn't be too close because it damages sperm. You are thinking on the right track. Blood flow is not on the right track because that does not have to do with the question. Okay, you, you correct, but we are just focusing on the sperm and what happens to the sperm and the blood flow really has nothing to do with the sperm count. Okay, so let's look at the memo and I'm going to talk through the memo as well. 2.1.3, 2.1.4, 2.1.5, 2.1.6, 2.1.7, 2.1.8, 2.1.9, 2.1.10, 2.1.11, 2.1.12, 2.1.13, 
says the testes will be further away from the body. That's important to mention. And the temperature of the testes will therefore be lower than the body temperature. And you must mention that. Or you must say um, three to four degrees. Uh, three to four. Um, two to three degrees lower than body temperature. Okay. If you said that, that would also be correct because you're mentioning the body temperature and that is for successful sperm production. So that's the one, one part of it. Okay. The other part of it, and I'm going to slow down here as well, is that if a man wears tight fitting underwear, it pulls the testis closer to the body. Now remember what I said, because the testis is close to the body, the temperature will now be too high or you can say too warm because it is close to the body. Right. And because the temperature is too high, the sperm does not mature. That's the one point. Or it negatively affects the sperm. Now, guys, you cannot say the sperm is just affected. So you can't take this word out and say the sperm production is affected. Why is this incorrect? This is incorrect because if you say sperm production is affected, you are not saying how it's affected. You're not telling me it's negatively affected. You're not saying to me it's positively affected. So you can't just say sperm production is affected. That's incorrect. You have to say it is negatively affected. Okay. So this word negatively, extremely important. Or you could say it leads to unhealthy sperm. All right. I hope that makes a bit of sense to you guys. Okay. I know it's a, it's a lot to take in. But I'm hoping you guys, you guys are following with me there. Okay. And 2.1.4, let's remind us of the question. It says, during a vasectomy, the vast difference is cut. Explain one reason why A, the man does not have children, and B, the vasectomy, even though as a vasectomy, can still ejaculate. The answer is for A, there will be no sperm in the semen. And that's what I explained to you guys. Okay. You have to say no sperm in the semen. The mark is on semen. The mark is not on no sperm. And that's important to remember. If you just said no sperm, so if I take that away, that would be incorrect. Okay, that's going to be wrong because I said to you guys this, the man still has sperm, but there is no sperm in the semen. And that's the correct answer. And therefore, there is no fertilization that will be taking place or pregnancy cannot occur or the woman cannot fall pregnant. Anything along the lines of that would be correct. So no sperm in the semen or no sperm is ejaculated. Therefore, no fertilization or no pregnancy can occur. All right. And the B part, as I explained, the fluid part of the semen is still produced. And remember, I said, where does it come from? From the accessory glands, or you can say the seminal vesicles, or you could say the prostate gland, or you could say the corpus gland. Any one of those would be correct. Okay, so two things to take away here. When a man has a vasectomy, there's no sperm in the semen. Please remember to write semen. Don't write no sperm. That's incorrect. No sperm in the semen. Or no sperm ejaculated in the semen. That's correct. And therefore, the woman cannot fall pregnant. And B, there is still fluid part of the sperm is uh, the semen is still produced so you have to mention that and you have to say it's produced by the accessory glands like the seminal vesicles the prostate gland or the corpus gland <coughs> okay and that was number 2.1.4 okay hi sir you, yeah melissa you have about 20 minutes remaining of your session thank you thank you so much melissa Okay, so let's go on to 2.2. Okay, this one is uh, quite straightforward. Um, here you are dealing with the sperm and the ovum. Okay, 2.2.1 says tabulate one difference between the structure of the ovum and the sperm. And here I just want to mention one very, very important thing. Okay, when it says tabulate, you obviously have to make a table. Okay, but the important thing about making a table is that you have to make a comparative table or you have to list comparative differences. What does that mean? You have to compare apples to apples. So when you are writing about the sperm is mobile or the sperm can move, you have to say the ovum cannot move, just as an example. But if you're writing about the sperm is small and you say the ovum can't move, now you're not comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges. 
So when you speak about the size of the sperm, speak about the size of the ovum as well. When you speak about um, the movement of the sperm, speak about the movement of the ovum, meaning you're comparing apples to apples, and uh, make sure that it is comparative differences. So one difference here, this is quite a simple one. Just want to go to the memo. Here's your table. You have your sperm cell. You have your ovum cell. And here you speak about the size. The sperm is very really small. The ovum is large. So there you can see you compare in the two sizes. And then the structure, you can say the sperm has a head, middle piece, and a tail, whereas the ovum is just round, nucleus in the middle. And then if you speak about movement or motility, the sperm can move um, and the ovum cannot move. So always compare apples to apples. Size, both sides. You're comparing size to and structure. You're comparing structure to structure. Don't say the sperm is small and the ovum can't move because now you're not comparing the two. You lose that mark. Okay. And it's always two marks for any two or any one difference, meaning one day and one day, and then one mark for the table. Okay. That's quite an easy one over there. 2.2.2 um, has to do with the head of the sperm contains a protein digesting enzyme. Why is that important for fertilization? So we know that there's an enzyme here in the acrosome of the sperm, and that enzyme is going to hit the ovum, and it has to obviously um, enter the ovum to get to the nucleus. So why is that enzyme important? You have to now speak about two things here because it is two marks. Okay, so the one thing you have to speak about is that the sperm needs to penetrate the outer layer of the ovum cell. That's the one thing. And the second thing is that the nucleus of the sperm has to get to the nucleus of the egg. And that's going to be your two marks over there. So if you look at that answer here, simply that the enzymes will digest the outer coat of the ovum. That's quite an easy one. Okay. To enable the head to penetrate the ovum so that the nuclei can fuse or so that the nucleus of the sperm can fuse with the nucleus of the ovum. If you wrote something about the chromosomes, that would also be correct. Okay, 2.2.3 was a calculation, and you guys can always expect a calculation. It's a simple one. It says an active healthy sperm cell is able to swim about 4 millimeters per minute. Um, it's a distance from the cervix to the end of the fallopian tube is 20 centimeters. How long does it take for the sperm to reach the fallopian tube or the end of the fallopian tube? Now, here you have to notice two things. One, this is 4 millimeters. It means just do that. And this is 20 centimeters. So what must you do here first? The math lit kiddies will tell me, sir, I must convert this, meaning I must make sure that both of them is in the same unit. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to centimeters? Are you going to go to millimeters? The easiest thing is to take your centimeters to millimeters. Okay, so you're going to say 20 centimeters. How do I go from centimeters to millimeters times 10? That's going to give me 200. And then you simply do a division. 200 divided by 4 will give you the time there. Okay, so here you guys can see 20 centimeters to 200 millimeters. You get a mark for that. You just do that. And then you just say 20 millimeters now divided by 4 will give you 50 minutes. Okay, very simple, very straightforward calculation. Three easy marks. You guys can expect something like this in the test. There will always, always be a calculation over there. Okay. And then um, lastly on question 2, then 2.4, 2.2.4, has to do with semen has a pH of about 7.5. Um, how does the sperm survive the certain conditions in the urine? Meaning how does it make sure that sperm cell does not get killed as it travels through the urethra of the male? Here you have to obviously know that because your sperm cell is surrounded by fluid, okay, um, the sperm cell will, or the urethra will always be cleaned prior to your ejaculation because it is um, the secretion of the fluid from the corpus gland cleans the urethra. That might not be something you guys knew before, but make a note of that, that the urethra is cleaned prior to ejaculation or before that. Um, how? By the secretions of the corpus gland. Okay. Um, and then that's it for number 2.2.4. Um, 2.3, just to speak about this one um, for the last few minutes, we're going to have to pick up probably on question 3 tomorrow. Uh, here you have to do with uh, menstruation or the menstrual cycle. And this, this is a very, very common question you are going to be asked. 
and the menstrual cycle is something you guys need to study very, very, very detailed and very, very carefully. Okay. So the diagram below shows you how the ovaries and the uterus are uh, changed by various hormones during the menstrual cycle. Um, and you must study this diagram. Now, as I explained to you before, guys, the first thing you do, you label. Okay, so label X, Z, Y. You always label, and then you answer your questions and label V. Right, so here I'm going to make this one interactive as well. Um, I want you guys to label for me the following. I'm going to put up all the questions, and let's see who brings the fastest questions through. Name the hormone at V. So give me the hormone here at V. Um, name the hormone at X. I want you to give me that hormone's name. Um, name the hormone at Y. I want you to give me that hormone's name. And then name the hormone Z. I want you guys to give me that hormone's name over there. I'm going to give about two minutes for that. Okay, just name X, Y, Z. Just fill in those hormones for me quickly. I have estrogen. What is estrogen perseverance? Is it X, Y, Z? I want you to write to me V, X, Y. That's estrogen. What is progesterone? What is FSH? Just label those hormones for me. Okay, V. Okay, so we have V. V is estrogen. We still need X. We still need Y. We still need Z. We have about 30 or so seconds. Okay, X is LH and Z is FSH. Okay, I still need Y. Anyone for hormone Y? We have about 10 seconds, then we'll look at the answers. Anyone for hormone Y? About five seconds. Why? I see a corpus luteum. <clears throat> okay. Anyone else? And I think I'm going to start. That's uh, 11.35. So this will probably be the last thing we are going to look at. And then we'll pick up um, question three probably tomorrow. OK, I'll do question 2.4 just before we go. So if I if I ask you to identify the hormones, you have to understand what you're looking at here, basically. OK, so normal um, 2.3.1, the name hormone V. We know V is estrogen. That's quite easy. What effect does estrogen have on the lining of the endometrium? So estrogen will obviously thicken your endometrium. That's the first thing you need to understand. So anything along the lines of it makes the endometrium more thicker. That would be correct. Corpus luteum from symphony. That is absolutely correct for um, for why. But I want the hormone. So you are looking at the same as uh, perseverance. The corpus luteum is that. But they asked you for... Um, the hormone. Okay, so think about the hormone then, and I'll come back to that. So V is estrogen, and that releases uh, or that thickens the endometrium. And why is that important for the endometrium to be thickened? We know that it's going to help for the for the implantation of the um, zygote, okay, or the implantation of the fetus by the endometrium. 2.3.1. Why is progesterone? That is absolutely correct. Manzum Tombo. So they got it right. Okay, so we're going to look at that now. Uh, so I did now 2.3.1 A, B, and C. I hope you guys uh, that made sense for you. That's estrogen. B is it thickens the endometrium lining. And C, um, it helps for the in, in, implantation of the embryo. Hormone X, where does hormone X come from? It comes from the pituitary gland. Um, and what does hormone X do? 
Human X is going to work on this thing over here and this thing over here. So hormone X, we need to understand, <clears throat> must come from the pituitary gland and it's going to be LH. Okay, I think I did get that in the chat. Um, LH and Z is FSH. That is absolutely correct. So now you have FSH here for Z, LH here, progesterone D. And now the answers will make perfectly sense. Okay, the function of hormone X, we just heard now it's LH, and we know LH will stimulate ovulation. So that's going to help ovulation to be stimulated there. And then um, which hormone is secreted by structure Y? So a lot of, not a lot of you, I think two people said, two schools said, Y is the corpus luteum. That is correct. This is the corpus luteum. But remember the corpus luteum secretes a hormone as well. And that hormone that it secretes is progesterone. Okay, so that Y would be progesterone. And then um, name the two functions of the hormone in Y. Quite simple. Progesterone is going to help maintain the um, endometrium. So it's going to maintain your lining over there. And then um, name two functions of the hormone mentioned in question 2.3.3. Now you have to go back and see what did I answer by question 2.2.3. I answered progesterone and I just did those functions there. And then hormone Z we said was um, if it's H because it's going to help your, stimu um, your follicles to be stimulated or produce your follicles. And then the function there, quite simple, helps for the development of the follicles. And then 2.3.7, what will happen to the levels of hormone Z? So now what was hormone Z again? FSH. So what's going to happen to FSH um, in the bloodstream if the levels of the hormone in 2.3.3, what hormone was that? That was progesterone, will increase. So if FSH and progesterone have a negative impact, meaning if the one increases, the other one decreases. Okay. And that is just summarized for you guys over here. Okay, so let me just show you this once again. So there was estrogen, increases the thickness of the endometrium, and the role of the of the of the endometrium, it provides a place where the embryo can implant. Okay, and then we had LH, luteinizing hormone, produces the graft follicle to burst or cause it to burst, and then it stimulates the development of the corpus luteum. And then finally, progesterone prepares the endometrium and then also thickens the endometrium and maintains it as well. Okay, and then here was FSH for 2.3.5. So remember now, FSH is the hormone at Z, and the function there is it produces follicles. Let's see when I have a chat here. Okay, that was just the register. And then give two reasons why in the diagram that shows you fertilization did not occur. Very popular question here. Okay, so if you look at this diagram, um, you need to provide evidence that shows you that the fertilization did not occur. Now, the first question is, how do you know when fertilization occurred, like it did occur? You would know when the endometrium lining is maintained, meaning it stays thick. Okay. However, in this diagram, I want you to look at towards the end here. You can see from this point here in the middle, towards the end, the lining is going down, meaning it's being shed or it's getting smaller. So the one reason here is that the endometrium lining is getting smaller, as you guys can see over there. Um, and also the corpus luteum is degenerating. So you can look at two things here. You can look at the endometrium lining, how it's getting smaller, and that shows you that fertilization did not occur. And you can also see that the corpus luteum, which is this structure over here, becomes smaller and that shows you fertilization did not occur. If fertilization did occur, the corpus luteum would remain um, the size that it is. It wouldn't get smaller. Okay. Um, and that was 2.3.8. Okay. I'm going to do 2.4 quickly. It's a quick one because it's not um, so difficult. So I'm going to do this one last and then we can pick up on question three tomorrow. So here you are shown a graph, and a graph shows you the normal insulin production over 24-hour period. Okay, so here you start at 6 a.m. up until 6 p.m., which is there, and here you have insulin concentration on the y-axis, and you have time in hours on the x-axis. All right, now they ask you what is the function of insulin? That's just a simple one that will obviously um, stimulate the conversion of glucose to glycogen to bring down the blood glucose level. Name the hormone that will have the opposite effect on blood glucose level than insulin. If I can ask someone to tell me that one, fastest person on the chat. 
2.4.2. Uh, 2.4.3 says what time of day is the insulin concentration the highest? Very simple, you just look at where is it the highest. So there's two peaks here. There's the first peak and there's the second peak. But if you take a ruler, you'll see the second peak is higher and that's around one o'clock. So that's around 1 p.m. over there. Okay, I'm still waiting for number 2.4.2. .2. Okay, that's on you guys. This in the chat, tell me what woman has the opposite effect on the blood glucose level. Uh, 2.4.4 says, what is the insulin concentration at four? Very simple, you just read that one off. So look for four o'clock, you read it off over there. I see there's an answer here for me, glucagon. Fantastic, that is the right one. So that would be glucagon. And then 2.5, 4.5, describe the action of insulin when a person eats breakfast at seven o'clock. So here at seven o'clock, the person is eating breakfast and you can see the insulin levels increase. And this one you can also find in your handout. It's the um, effect of um, blood glucose on insulin. And it's this whole story here about blood glucose level will increase after meal. The pancreas will secrete insulin in the blood, which will then travel to the liver. And then that will stimulate the conversion of glucose to glycogen. And glycogen is stored, which will bring down the glucose level or make the glucose level decrease. Okay, that's also written in your mind, the gap and in your exam guideline. Okay, um, and then lastly, um, it says um, at which two points in the time frame will the blood glucose level be the lowest? Now, I want you guys to focus here very carefully as we, as we end off. They're talking about the blood glucose level, okay, where it's lowest. What does the graph show you? Does the graph show you blood glucose or does it show you insulin? It shows you insulin. And where insulin is highest, that's where blood glucose would be lowest. And where insulin is lowest, that's where blood glucose will be highest. So when the question asks where will blood glucose be the lowest, what do you look for? You go look for where is insulin the highest. And it's here around nine o'clock, also there around one o'clock. So the answer there would be between nine and one o'clock. Why? because that's where the insulin is the highest. Okay, and I hope that makes sense to you guys. Okay, I see my time is up, so we're gonna pick up question three tomorrow. If I can give you guys some homework, I know you guys haven't worked through this yet, but if I can ask you to please for tomorrow to work through 3.1.3 for me, at least, as well as draw this graph for me by 3.2.1. You can work through the whole question, that'll be fantastic. But if I ask you to at least, at least for tomorrow, do 3.1.3 as well as the graph. I just want to give you guys tips on the graph as well as tips on this and explain to you how we mark that. Okay, so do the whole question if you have time. If you don't have time, at least do 3.1.3 and 3.2.1. Okay, thank you guys for listening. That is the end of my session. I know I rushed towards the end and we'll pick this up tomorrow. But I thank you for your interaction and for um, listening. So I'll see you guys tomorrow um, for session two. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, grade 12s.